that you would join us uh, on this Palm Sunday, uh, this Sunday before Easter. Uh, we're very grateful that you would tune in with us. We hope that you have had uh, a good morning and that you got a full cup of coffee or orange juice or whatever your beverage of choice is. I want to begin our time together uh, just with, uh, with a thought. This week I was reminded of uh, the English 19th century preacher Charles Haddon Spurgeon. Uh, he wrote many different volumes. And uh, one of the books that he wrote was a book of illustrations called The Bible and the Newspaper. He took some of the stories of his day and drew some spiritual implications out of them. But one of the things that he mentioned in that book was that a Christian is to keep one eye on the newspaper, but another eye on the Lord. And the things that we see in the newspaper should be filtered through and interpreted by the things that we know to be true about the Lord. We have a tendency in our day to interpret what we know about the Lord through the news of the day instead. And uh, we are supposed to be the other way around. What we see happen around us uh, should make sense in light of the truths that we know about who God is, uh, what he has promised to us, and the work that he does. And, uh, and so I want to begin our time together with, uh, before I pray, with reading a passage from, from Isaiah chapter 40. There are 66 chapters in the book of Isaiah, just like there are 66 books in your Bible. Uh, there are 39 chapters of, of judgment and prophecy in, uh, in Isaiah that to, at the very beginning, just like there are 39 books in the Old Testament. But in chapter 40, there's a pivot. There's a turn to uh, the promise of the Messiah who will come. Just like in the 40th book of your Bible, the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus shows up and begins his work. This is found at the end of Isaiah chapter 40, and I believe it's a good way for us to begin our time this morning. The people uh, of Isaiah's day were tempted to look around themselves and ask the question, has God forgotten us? And yet this is what he says in Isaiah chapter 40, verse 27. Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel, that my way is hidden from the Lord? My, way is, my right is disregarded by God. Um, I'm hidden from God. He doesn't see me anymore. And then he answers with this statement. Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is an everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint. He does not grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint. And to him who has no might, he increases strength. Even youths will faint and be weary, and, and young men will fall exhausted but those who wait for the Lord will renew their strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles. They will run and not be weary. They will walk and not be faint. Lord, we ask you this morning, as we gather together virtually, to sit under you and to hear you speak through your word. As we consider these truths and echo them back to you in song, we ask you, Lord to give us perspective. Your, words, your word says that your ways are higher than our ways. Your thoughts greater than our thoughts. Would you, would you peel back the curtain a bit and would you help us to see from your perspective? Father, we are weary people in need of rest. We are weak people in need of strength. Would you come to us this morning? Would you visit us? We ask you to come, Lord Jesus, to bless us, allow us to see you, to sense your presence, and to feel the fullness of your Holy Spirit. Would you give us perspective this morning as we open your word to seek truth? We pray that that would give us perspective when we consider our own hearts, our own lives, and the events around us. We trust this time to you. And we pray that every word of our mouths, every meditation of our hearts would be acceptable in your sight. O oh Lord, our rock and our redeemer. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I want to ask you to join me in worship this morning. Well, good morning, church. It's good to be able to lead you in worship this morning. We've been able to add mon a monitor where you can follow along with the words and sing with us. Also, I want to invite you to turn to go to our website, fbcmonticello.com, and we've got a Spotify account there that has playlists that has a lot of the songs for worship. 
So I encourage you to go there, and as you uh, can sing along, as you're walking, as you're working at home, you can be listening to a lot of songs. They'll just encourage you through this time. But let's all join together as we sing the way. Through every battle, every heartbreak, through every circumstance, you are there.
sits on heaven's mercy seat. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. With all creation I see praise to the King of kings. You are my everything, and I will adore you. Clothed in rainbows, all living color, flashes of light. Strength and glory and power be to you, the only wise King. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. With all creation I sing. Praise to the King of Peace. You are my everything, and I will adore you. Filled with wonder. Your name is power, breath and living water, such a marvelous mystery. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. With all creation I see praise to the King of kings. You are my everything and I will adore you. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. With all creation I Praise to the King of Kings. You are my everything, and I will adore you. Let's sing holy, holy, holy.
Well, there are some songs throughout history that never get old, and that's certainly one of them, and it is a song that we will continue to sing for all of eternity. In Revelation chapter 4, uh, we'll be in the book of Revelation today, in the last chapter, chapter 22, but in Revelation chapter 24, we get a scene of the throne room. And this, uh, this was given to the early church to be a picture of what's taking place in heaven right now and give perspective to the hardship that is to come. And it says here that, that living creatures are gathered around the throne and that they never cease to sing, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and who is to come. It says that they say, that they cry out, Worthy are you, O Lord our God to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. It's that vision of who God is and what He has done that gives perspective to the lives that we live here on earth. And I want to encourage you with that this morning. That with so much uncertainty and hardship going on around us and within us, that God is faithful and that He is good. Um, like many people and like many businesses and organizations uh, we here at First Baptist Church uh, are walking through the same challenges you are and we're walking with you it is our desire during these days to, to pray for you and to support you and to continue the ministries uh, that we have so that you can continue to be built up in the Lord and fulfill the mission that He has for you uh, this uh, it's economically and spiritually and socially has affected the church just as it has everyone. Uh, and we know many of you are walking through challenges with work and your own finances and putting food on the table. And I just want to encourage you to remember as you walk through your budget and as you walk through uh, your resources uh, to stay faithful to the Lord and to give as you can, to give generously toward the church. We've already walked through our budget and eliminated uh, non-essential spending, and uh, if trends continue, we will uh, we will see about 50, uh, maybe 60 percent of the resources we need to to make our budget. And so we want to encourage you uh, to remain faithful in giving, so that we can continue the ministries that we have during this time. Uh, just like you, we want to know uh, how God would have us to live, and how we can continue to fulfill the mission that He has for us uh, during the time now, because we believe as you do that the light of the gospel shines the brightest during the darkest of days. And so one of the ways that you can continue to fulfill the mission God has for you is to partner with us in loving, equipping, and going and sending. I want to pray for us, and I want to pray for you as um, we continue our time of worship. And so uh, from your place there at home or wherever you are, uh, let's bow together and seek the Lord. Father, we thank you this morning for giving us a vision, an eternal vision of who you are, what you're doing. You're seated on a throne, which means that you are ruling and reigning over even the greatest of challenges that we experience. We thank you that though our circumstances change, that you never do. That all your ways praise your perfect holy name. Father, I pray this morning and in these days that you would give us a heart and a mind that is full of truth about who you are, what your purposes are, and what you promise to your people. We know that you are trustworthy. And so I pray that you will help us to rely upon you during these days to be all that we need, all that we love. I thank you for my friends at home and I pray that they would know these truths, that they would cling to them during these days. We know that our greatest threat is not a virus, but it is the, the sin that remains within us. So I pray that you would help us to loathe sin in our own hearts, the sin that's around us, and to seek righteousness that's found in you. And Lord, I pray that you would keep us safe. I pray that you would keep us from harm's way, that you would protect us 
You would keep us healthy. Not just so that we can enjoy comfort, but so that we can fulfill the mission that you have for us. Lord, I pray for our our medical professionals, that you would guard them and sustain them during these days, that you would give them wisdom. I thank you for our government officials, that you, I ask that you would give them wisdom as they seek to lead us and help us to be wise, help us to follow their lead. You've given them to us as, um, as ministers of your justice, of your righteousness. Help us to regard them in that way. Help us to not be proud and insist upon our own rights and our own ways. But help us to follow them as we would follow you. Lord, I pray for our fathers and mothers and grandparents, those who are raising families. And Lord, we rely ultimately upon you to sustain us. We rely upon you to fill us, to give us all that we need. And not just to give us what we need, but to be all that we need. Would you help us to rely upon you during these days? Father, I I thank you for this church. I thank you for the mission that you have given to us. And I pray that through whatever means you deem appropriate, that you would continue to supply us with all that we need to fulfill the mission that you've given to us. Help us as a church as individual members, but also as a body together, to live with an open hand, to seek to receive that we might give. Would you help us to be generous with our resources and with the gospel? Father, you are good, and all that you do is good. We thank you for for anything that you allow or bring into our lives that causes us to cling more closely to you and to rely more upon you for strength. And so during this time would you help us would you empower us would you strengthen us in ways that only you can would you do a work during this time that only you can do would you do something during these days that one day when we look back we say it was good and it was worth it Lord we love you we praise you we thank you for allowing us to join in with a song that will be sung all throughout eternity. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and who is and who is to come. Worthy are you to receive glory and honor and power. You are good and all that you do is good. Together with, while separated in presence, we lift our joined hearts up together. And we worship you. And we pray all this in your matchless name. Amen.
the truth and the light. Perfect Savior, the blood that washed us white, the God who was and is and shall be Thank you, praise team, for leading us. I want to ask you to turn with me in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 22. Revelation chapter 22, it's the last chapter in your Bible, so it should be fairly easy to find. Over the last several weeks, we have looked at the the several I Am statements of Jesus in the Gospel of John. And one of the things that we've seen in that is that is that all that Jesus is, He is on our behalf. He is the bread that's come down from heaven to satisfy the hunger of our heart. He is the light of the world that illuminates darkness. He is the good shepherd who guides and guards and gives to His flock. He is the door. He's the only way to the Father. He is the resurrection and the life, bringing life from death eternally, but then also in our daily lives. He is the way, the truth, and the life, the only one who can save us. 
He is the true vine, which means he is the constant supply to his people. This morning, I want to take a look at, at a few I am statements of Jesus that are often left out in the list of his I am statements. They're found in the last ten verses of your Bible. And these are statements about himself that Jesus gave to his people that should give them perspective and courage to face the uncertainties of life until he comes. Now, of all the books of the Bible, the book of Revelation can be one of the most challenging to understand. Revelation is an apocalyptic book, which means that it is something that is, uh, the, the truth and the reality of it is sometimes hidden in apocalyptic, almost science fiction kind of language. We don't know exactly the kind of things that John was seeing. We know that they're real, but he wrapped them up in language that certainly was understood during his own time, but he also went back to the Old Testament quite a bit for some of his illusions. In fact, about uh, half of Revelation points back to Old Testament sources, like the Gospel, of I, the Gospel of Isaiah, the Old Testament prophet of Isaiah, Zechariah and Daniel, even the first book of the Bible, Genesis. Some people take all of Revelation literally, and some people take it all figuratively. How should we read it? Well, we should believe that all of it is God's Word. We should believe it. Uh, we should read it. We should love it. Now, one of the things for us to remember is that godly people all throughout history have had different interpretations of some of the events of Revelation, like the tribulation, uh, the millennium, the uh, identity of the 144,000 people. And you might say, Brother Will, do, do you know the answers to any of those questions? Uh, I, I'm familiar with most of the positions, and, and I have some pretty good ideas. But at the end of the day, I'm just like anyone else. Ultimately, I don't know exactly how it's going to pan out when it comes to some of those finer points. I remember one preacher saying, saying it this way, that when it comes to the events of the book of Revelation, I'm not on the planning committee. I'm on the welcoming committee. What we do know is that the book of Revelation is God's word. It is to be read and it is to, belie to be believed. And so I want to begin this morning in Revelation chapter 22, verse 12. These are the concluding words of the Lord Jesus to John and to us. In verse 12, he says, Behold, I am coming soon, bringing my recompense with me to repay everyone for what he has done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes so that they may have the right to the tree of life. Do you remember the tree of life in Genesis chapter 2? It reappears here at the very end. And they may enter, by, enter the city by the gates. Outside are the dogs. It's a picture uh, not of literal pets, but of unbelievers. Dogs and sorcerers, the sexually immoral, murderers and idolaters. Everyone who loves and practices falsehood. Those who clung to their sin and false identities more than they clung to the Lord. He says, I, Jesus, have sent my angel, my messenger, to testify to you about these things to the churches. I am the root and the descendant of David, the bright morning star. The Spirit and the bride say, come. And let the one who hears say, come. And the one who is thirsty, let him come. Let the one who desires take the water of life. Without price. This is a reference to Isaiah chapter 55 verse 1. I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. That if anyone adds to them. God will add to him the plagues described in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy. God will take away his share in the tree of life. And in the holy city. Which are described in this book. He who testifies to these things says surely. I am coming soon the third time in this chapter that he makes that statement. And John says at that point, Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with all. Amen. The first thing that I want to do this morning is to review 
the end times. The end times, it's a phrase that's thrown around a lot. When trial and uncertainty come, whether it be a, um, an ungodly leader in another nation or a global pandemic, people will ask the question, are we living in the end times? To which the answer to that is an emphatic yes. We are living in the end times. But the biblical writers understood the end times to be that period of time that began when Jesus ascended. And so the church, ever since Jesus ascended into heaven in Acts chapter 1, has been living in the end times. Many throughout history, though, have wondered whether or not they were potentially the last generation of the end times. Now the answer to that is different. We don't know. We don't know. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 24, verse 36, Concerning that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son. If Jesus doesn't know, then a TV preacher probably needs to keep his mouth shut on declaring that this is the end times and Jesus is coming back next Thursday. Only the Father knows, he says. For as were the days of Noah so will be the coming of the Son of Man. The days of Noah, he says. Well, what was it like in the days of Noah? Well, Genesis chapter 6, verse 5 tells us that the Lord saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intention of the thoughts of their hearts, listen to this description, was only evil continually. And so, God sent a flood for over a hundred years, 120 years to be exact, God prophesied that judgment is coming through his prophet Noah. Nobody listened. And so God was not unjust in sending a flood. He gave them 120 years of warning to say repent and believe, but they didn't. And so God sent the flood. The ungodly were swept away. And at the end, only the righteous remained. And Jesus said that in the end times, it's going to be like that. It will be the final fulfillment of Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. When God prophesied to the serpent, He will bruise your head, and you will bruise His heel. Well, the heel of Jesus has already been bruised in death, and His foot was placed firmly on the head of the serpent with His own resurrection. But when He returns, when He shows up the second time, He will finally stamp down fully, and He will extinguish the power and the dominion of that serpent that's been tormenting us ever since. How will it happen, you ask? Well, do you remember in Acts chapter 1 when Jesus ascended into heaven? It says that after he did that, in verse 9, when he said those things, as the disciples were looking on, he was lifted up. And a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes. And they said, Men of Galilee... Why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taking up from you into heaven, he will come in the same way that you saw him go into heaven. In the same way that he ascended before his disciples, he will return to us. We don't know exactly when it's going to happen, but the Bible tells us that it could happen at any moment. So Brother Will, could he come today? He could come today. He could come at any moment. There is nothing left in history to be fulfilled Uh, in order for Jesus to come. And so he tells us in Matthew 24, verse 44, and he says, you must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour that you do not expect. When you least expect it, Jesus will return. And when it does happen, this will take place. Revelation chapter 20, verse 10, tells us that when Jesus returns... The devil who had deceived people all over the world was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur where the beast and the false prophet were. And they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Cartoons and movies portray Jesus uh, or portray the devil as this, as this little lord of, of, of hell who reigns over all of his minions. But he will be just as tormented as, as anyone else will be for eternity. He won't be in charge of anything. Verse 11 tells us that I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it. 
And from his presence, earth and sky fled away, and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. And then another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books, according to what they had done. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it, death and Hades, the afterlife, gave up the dead who were in them, and they were judged, each one of them, according to what they had done. And then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. And then I saw a new, the Greek word here means a renewed heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven... And the first earth had passed away and the sea, indicative or picturing fear, was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them As their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And death will be no more. Neither will there be mourning nor crying nor pain anymore. For the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said. Behold. I am making all things new. And he said write this down. For these words are trustworthy. And true. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty, I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. The one who conquers, how do we conquer, you might ask? With belief. Your work, Jesus says in John chapter 6, is to believe in the one that the Father has sent, to believe in Him. That's how we conquer. And anyone who conquers will have this heritage. And I will be His God. He will be my Son. Revelation chapter 5 tells us that the righteous will be a kingdom and priests to our God and they will reign on the earth. God's people who have been redeemed who have been restored, who have been made like Jesus, will one day finally fulfill Genesis chapter 1, verse 28. We will fulfill the mission for which we were created. But for those who do not believe in Jesus, for those who do not repent of sin, for those who are not saved, verse 8 tells us, as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, for murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. There's no such thing as a soul sleep in which they just go to sleep spiritually and stay there. There's no such thing as a final annihilation to the point of where they suffer to the point of a death and then they cease from existence. They will ever die but never finally die, being tormented in a place that was created for the devil and his demons. It was created for them. But those who end up in hell with them choose to go there by not believing in Jesus. What's the most important thing to remember when it comes to the end times? That unless Jesus comes back, all of us will die. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. We will await with Jesus in heaven this moment, awaiting our glorified bodies and our eternal home. Jesus will one day come in the clouds and every eye will see Him and and His saints will come with Him. Satan will be finally judged and condemned. There will be a renewal of heaven and earth. The, The answer to that prayer that we've been praying, our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be Your name, Your kingdom come, Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, will finally be made true when the heavens and the earth will be fused together as one, making life and our existence 
the way that God has always intended. It will be perfect again and God will reign not in one little garden in the Middle East, but He will reign over all creation. There will be a judgment. We will all stand before the Lord. We will be judged by our works. You mean, Brother Will, that we will have to answer to the Lord for our works? I thought that we're saved by grace, not by works. Well, I said to you earlier that the first work is to believe. It is to believe in Jesus for salvation. And those who have not repented of sin and believed in Jesus, they will be judged by their sin and they will be sentenced to hell with the devil. But those who trust in Jesus, we will be judged by our works, not for punishment, but for reward. We will answer to the Lord for what we have done with what He has given to us. And then we will spend eternity with Him. Those who know the Lord will finally see Him face to face. They will be perfectly united to Him. They will have free interchange with Him. There won't be an ungodly fear. There will be a love and a reverence and an intimacy that we've never experienced before. We will finally inherit the earth. The fulfillment of Psalm 37, the meek will inherit the earth and that will happen. What should we do between now and then? We should believe and we should be ready. We should believe and we should be ready. But I also want to give you some reminders as we face the end times. And they come from these statements that Jesus gives to us about himself in Revelation chapter 22. The first statement that he makes, he says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end, which is another way of Jesus saying, I am supreme. I am supreme. That word Alpha is the first letter in the Greek alphabet. And you guessed it, Omega is the last Jesus is saying, I am the A to Z of history. I am the storyline of history. He is the frame that makes everything else that's ever happened make sense. He is the substance of history. It all points to Him. He is also the sovereign of history. Jesus possesses all control over history. All history originates with Jesus. It points to Jesus. It ends with Jesus. It is for Him, in Him, and by Him. Jesus is supreme. And if He is this to all of history, friend, I ask you the question, is He this to you? Is Jesus the supreme storyline of your life? Is Jesus the substance of your life? Is Jesus the sovereign Lord of your life? If your life can make sense apart from Jesus, yours is not a life that saves. It is a life that will come to a crashing halt when Jesus returns. And if you are If you are not, if you're not ready, if Jesus is not supreme over your life, your ambitions, your values, your actions, then you need to seriously consider whether or not you are rightly related to Him. Money is not supreme. Work is not supreme. Lifestyle is not supreme. Hobbies are not supreme. Grades are not supreme. Status is not supreme. Politics are not supreme. Jesus is supreme. He is the Alpha and the Omega. The beginning and the end. The first and the last. He also says in this passage, I am the root and descendant of David. He's both the root and the descendant of David. Which is another way to say Jesus is trustworthy. Jesus is supreme 
He's also trustworthy. David was viewed as the greatest king in all of Israel. Uh, But even the Israelites knew after his time that he was a mere shadow that existed to point to a greater reality that would come with the greater king, the Messiah, who would one day come and fulfill the promises of God to restore God's people. Prophecies in the Bible that stated that the king, this future Messiah, would, would come through David's family. And so Jesus is saying right here, I am the root and the descendant of David. He says, I brought David into existence. David is nothing without me. Without me there is no David. But he's also saying, I am the offspring of David. I am the root and the fruit of David. I made the promise and I fulfill the promise. Which means I'm trustworthy. You can trust me. I'm not a a dictator lord who lords over you that you don't know whether or not he's going to lead well. Yes, I am supreme, but I'm also trustworthy. So I ask you, are you relying upon Jesus today? Are you living by his promises? Friend, you can trust Jesus to be and do all that he ever promises to be and do. That's good news. That's really good news for us. The stock market might change. Circumstances might change. Health might change. You may not be able to find hand sanitizer or toilet paper. But if you believe the promises of God fulfilled for us in Jesus, then you have all you ever truly need. Jesus is trustworthy. He's supreme. And He's trustworthy. He also says, I am the bright morning star. I am the bright morning star, which is another way of Jesus saying, I am just getting started. It's often said, you've probably heard this before, that the darkest hour is just before the dawn. I don't know whether or not that's literally true. But Jesus is acknowledging here with this statement the pain and the struggle and the separation that has taken place since He ascended into heaven. He knows that all things are not as they should be. And all of it that has passed has been like a long, dark, and difficult night for the church. But when Jesus makes this statement, He is saying to His church, Hold on, beloved. The sun is beginning to rise. The night will be no more. It is almost daytime. And when I show up, it will all be over. It will all be new. It will all be right. All that will have happened up to that point will be just like night before an eternal day. A new day is coming. A day that will never end. Hold on, church. I am just getting started. Dear friend, don't let the darkness of this night be more real to you than the light of that day. Don't let the terrors of the night grip you more than the blessedness of that day. Don't let the pain and the uncertainty fill you more than the joy of that day. The night, as real as it is, is almost over. The day is beginning to break. Hold on, church. The sun is coming. The sad, dark Chapter is almost over, but a new and eternal day is coming. Jesus is just getting started. But that's not all. Jesus says it three times in this chapter. Verse 7, verse 12, verse 20. Jesus says, I am coming soon. I am coming soon. Soon. The 
questions that we want answers to, the hurts that we need healed, the wrongs that we want righted. Brothers and sisters, they will only come to us when Jesus returns. And He will be here quickly. In the blink of an eye, will you be ready for Him? He could come at any moment. And so, let the cry of our heart and the trajectory of our lives and the desires and the ambitions, let they all scream in unison, Come, Lord Jesus, come. The first time that Jesus came, He came in secret, but the next time, everyone will see Him and everyone will know Him. The first time that He came, no one welcomed Him. But the next time, He will command attention and He will demand respect. For every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The first time, He was a child a vulnerable dependent, a Jewish commoner. But the next time he will be a majestic king, prepared for battle, victory, and an eternal reign. The first time he preached the gospel of the kingdom, and his word was, repent and believe. But the next time, friend, there will be no more opportunity. Those who have repented and believe, they will enjoy eternal reward. But those who haven't, they will have finally run out of time and they will spend eternity separated from God and tormented in hell. Jesus is supreme. Jesus is trustworthy. Jesus is just getting started. And Jesus is coming soon. Are you ready for Him? There are three responses that we might have in order to be ready for Jesus. Three responses to the end times. First of all, in regard to how we should think. How we should think. What should our perspective be? How should we live with one eye on the newspaper, or the internet, or cable news? How should we live with one eye there, and another eye fixed on Jesus? Well, first of all, we should have confidence. Because this is true. More true than the news that's being manufactured on television is the news that we see here in Scripture. This is true. He is true. We have confidence, but we also have courage. We have courage because we believe these things. All that He is, He is on our behalf. And so we have courage and we have confidence. But this also leads us to the place of contentment. We don't wrangle our hands. We're not wringing our hands. We're not twisting and contorting our minds, trying to figure out how to live. Contentment is not a settling for less than the best. We are content because we realize that this, that this life, as difficult as it is, is temporary. This life is temporary. And God, Romans 8.28, is working all things together for our good and for His glory. And therefore, nothing in this life that makes me rely more upon Jesus is ultimately harmful to me. Which means that if I have Him, I have all that I need to truly live, to to truly grow in godliness. I can be content. I can be confident. I can be courageous. That's how we should think. And I want to encourage you to fill your heart and your mind with these truths and let them shape you to the point of satisfaction, contentment, delight, courage, and confidence. What should we value? What should we value? I want to ask you a question. Are you willing to trust your eternal well-being to whatever it is that you build your life around right now? Are you willing to trust your eternal well-being to whatever it is that you are building your life 
spending your resources, working your calendar around what is it that is that front burner, non-negotiable king of everything else in life? Are you willing to bank your eternity on it? Anything other than Jesus is going to leave you disappointed. It may thrill you in the moment, but ultimately it'll be like filling your mouth with rocks or with quicksand. That's one thing about a season like the one that we're walking through now. It reveals frustration. It reveals withdrawals. It reveals disappointment. And the only reason we experience disappointment and frustration and withdrawals is because we realize whatever it is that we placed our hope in. Whatever it is we were relying upon to help us flourish. You remove that thing and we get the shakes. And some, some of you potentially are thrown into the spiritual shakes right now because your God has been taken away from you. But if your God is Jesus, you're fine and well. Do you truly value Jesus more than anyone or anything else? Reflect. Does He have rivals in your heart? Is Jesus less than God to you? As you reflect, if there's anything that's brought to mind that you've been hoping in more, repent of that. He is more willing to forgive than you are to repent. However much sin there is in your life, there's more of Jesus to be had. Would you acknowledge it to Him and ask Him to forgive you? And would you put it to the side? And would you instead fix your heart and your appetite on Him? Would you begin to orient everything else in your life around Jesus? If it doesn't enhance your love, accelerate your growth in godliness, if it doesn't help you to seek first the kingdom, if it's just constantly an interruption, an enemy to seeking first the kingdom then you need to reassess its importance in your life. Jesus is not trying to hurt you. He is not your killjoy. He's trying to save you. He's trying to make you more like Him. And then last, I'd say cherish Him. You'll never be more satisfied. You'll never be more full than when Jesus is most valuable to you. He's not the enemy of your happiness. God wants your happiness more than you want it. Only He's smart enough to know that He's the only place you're going to find it. So would you delight in Him and allow Him to give you wisdom on where to place everything else? How should we think? What should we value last? How should we live? How should we live? First, our lives should be one of worship. Our lives should be living echoes of the holiness and the glory and the sufficiency of Christ. Our lives exist to be living billboards to His glory and His goodness. That's a life of worship. We say it with our lips. We live it with our lives. It's a life of worship. Second, we respond with work. We put our hand to the plow because there is, a, there is coming a time when we won't be able to share Jesus with people anymore. We won't be able to make the most of our lives for the sake of His kingdom. We worship, we work, we watch, we look. Yes, we live in strange and uncertain times. But if you love Jesus, you can be confident about the future and you can be in peace right now. We worship, we work, We watch, and then one day, we will welcome His return. Until then, we say, come. Come, Lord Jesus. Would you come? Would you come into my heart? Would you come into my life? Would you come into this moment? Would you come into this conversation? Would you come in this relationship? Would you come in this hardship would you come would you make your presence known would you rule and would you reign would you clean house would you make it all make sense would you come there's a lot about the end times that I don't understand I don't know the identity of the antichrist or where he's going to come from 
But I do know who Jesus is. And I do know where He's coming from. I don't know what the next few weeks hold for you. But I do know this. I know how it all turns out according to this book. And I'm ready. I'm ready for this. The question is, are you? Would you pray with me? I want to encourage you at home to bow your heads, your hearts pointed towards the Lord. And I want to ask you, if Jesus were to return right now, would you be ready? Is He the sovereign Lord of your life? You know, a lot of people, especially in an affluent culture like ours, they just want Jesus for blessings. They just want Jesus for temporal comfort, experiences of peace. They want Him to be their Savior, but not their Lord. And friend, I just want to tell you, if you don't have Him as Lord, you don't have Him as Savior either. Jesus is either Savior and Lord, or to you, He's become neither. The only way to know the salvation of the Lord is to surrender your life entirely to Him. That includes asking for forgiveness of your sin, but it also means committing the rest of your life to His hand. That means He gets to be the boss. And that's a good thing, because He's the one who made you. He's the one who best knows how to orient your life and make the most sense of your life. Who you are, what you desire, where to point you, what you ought to be doing. If you've never truly surrendered your life to the Lord, ask Him to forgive you of your sin, ask Him to save you, then in this moment, He can come. He can change your heart. He can forgive you of sin. He can give you a bold, confident future. You may walk through the same hardships everyone else goes through. But you know how the story ends up. In your heart, if you realize that Jesus, you've never trusted Him to be God to you, would you call out to Him from your heart? Would you acknowledge your sin? Would you ask Him to save you? You don't have to say these exact words, but from your own heart, or even if you want to voice it with your lips, just call out to Him, to him and say, Jesus, I realize that You are God and that all of history only makes sense in light of who You are and what You've done. And I realize who You've created me to be. I realize that I can't be that because of sin in my life. I've rebelled against you and I want life on my own terms and I want to live for selfish pursuits. And I see that all that is just so much sin. But I see in your word that you came to save sinners. That while we were still sinners, you died for us so that the penalty of our sin can be removed. And so that we may have resurrection life. That we may be born again in our spirits now, but ultimately be raised to eternal life when you return. Lord Jesus, would you save me? Would you change me? The Bible tells us that if you ask Jesus to save you, that he will do it. If we confess with our mouths and believe in our heart that Jesus is Lord and God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. All who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. We invite Him in. If you ask the Lord to save you this morning, then I want to encourage you to just continue in prayer. Thank Him. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for saving me. Would you give me an awareness of your presence? Would you help me to hate sin and to prize you? Would you speak to me through your word? Would you help me? 
Continue to pray. The Bible tells us to pray without ceasing. You've just begun a relationship that never shuts off. He's ever present. He's never going to decline your phone calls. He's more willing to help than you are to ask. Maybe you know that you know the Lord. You have a relationship with Him this morning. But your tendency maybe is to fix both eyes on the news or on the stock market or on your health. Maybe this morning the Lord has reminded you that He alone is supreme. He alone is trustworthy. That He's just getting started and that He's coming soon. Would you ask Him to help you to trust to help you believe, to help you to live. We don't know what the future holds, but we know who holds the future. Would you trust Him? Lord Jesus, we thank You for all that You are to us. You are bread that satisfies. You are light that clarifies. You are the shepherd who cares. You are the door that gives access. You are the resurrection that gives life. You are the way and truth and life, the only way to the Father. You are the sufficiency of your people. You are the beginning and the end. You are the promise fulfilled. And here you are. You're coming. You're doing something new. The night is almost over. The eternal day is coming. Lord, we say come. We say come because we love you. We say come because we need you. Would you come, Lord Jesus? Would you save us? Would you satisfy us? Would you sustain us? Oh, how we long for you. We need you, Lord Jesus. We pray all this in your name. Amen.
of darkness and uncertainty we know that we can trust the Lord that all that God is He is for us in Jesus I want to encourage you this week to rely upon Jesus to be what He alone can be to you I pray this week Lord that you would be gracious to us that you would bless us and that you would make your face to shine upon us so that your name will be known on the earth and your saving power among all nations. Lord, we pray that our lives would be living billboards, reflecting your glory, your power, your wisdom, your kindness. That you would show your worth through our surrendered lives. We're not wise, we're not strong, we're not sufficient in and of ourselves. We need you. Thank you for reminding us of that. And now, would you show your glory would you show your might through us as we seek you. We love you. We pray that you would bless us this week for your sake. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to encourage you uh, to tune in with us again next week. It will be Easter Sunday, and we will continue to celebrate the resurrection. Easter is not canceled just because we can't uh, meet physically. But we'll be back here online at 10. Between then and now... You can join us again Wednesday, 10 o'clock in the morning for our kids' ministry, 7 o'clock at night for students. Thursday afternoon at 2, I'll give uh, an update from, uh, from here. And then uh, we'll have some, some more kid stuff over the course of the weekend, and then we'll be back here at 10 o'clock. Don't forget, if you want to give to continue to support the ministry of First Baptist Church, you can do so by going online. We've posted a link to where that you can go to. You can send in a check. You can give it to one of us when we come by and we will bring it right back here to the church. I promise. Uh, we love you. Thank you for your faithfulness. Know that we love you. We miss you and we're praying for you. Have a blessed week.